Hi, this is Pastor Bob Yanyan. Today's subject is glorification. Not only has God done everything great for us in life, He has something for us in eternity called a resurrection body. Woo, sound good? Let's go to the Word of God together and find out about it. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and study the Word of God with Bob Yandian. Welcome back to Student of the Word. Glad to have you here today. Up until now, we've had seven as far as I'm just concerned. These are doctrines from the Word of God. I call them the shuns. We're on glorification today. We've had sanctification and justification, a number of other uh, teachings. But today's the last one, and this is glorification. This has to do with our resurrection body when we get to heaven. And uh, we'll have that here at the rapture of the church. But the next stage is the moment we get a resurrection body, poof, we are in heaven. I mean, in a moment, the twinkling of an eye, this thing is going to occur. This is the final phase of our salvation. Let me give you the Greek word for that. It's doxadzo. It comes from doxa. And uh, we get the doxology from this word. The word doxa means glory. And about the best comparison there is, God, whenever he talks about glory, he talks about light an intense light. It says in heaven in chapter 15 of uh, 1 Corinthians, there are different levels of glory when it comes to our rewards in heaven. And some will shine like the different stars. No two stars have the same glory. And then some like the moon and some like the sun. And so it's just talking about different levels. And so this this light, Jesus uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration, was covered with the glory of God. And, and the Bible says his face shone like the sun. His raiment was as white as light. I mentioned this, the the disciples, the three, Peter, James, and John, must have put their hand in front of their face because it was so bright they couldn't see. Uh, one night, my wife and I went to eat at a restaurant. It was, I mean, it was dark outside, really, really dark. I was sitting there with my wife, and, and behind us was a, was a picture window. I mean, this big glass window that was the parking lot. And a guy pulled up and to let his wife out and left his lights on. I think he has brights on. I mean, I couldn't see. My, my wife's face disappeared. It was so bright. And I said, honey, move your, move your head to the left. But she did to where I could finally see her. But around her was this glow coming. And he sat there and must have talked to his wife for five minutes. I just wanted you to shut the, the lights off. So again, this is, this is what doxa is. It's God's glory. And the word here for glorification is doxadzo. It means to honor or to magnify. The meaning is glorification glorification, the final phase of salvation at the receiving of a resurrection body. In fact, it's called a glorified body. This will occur at the rapture of the church. Look with me at Romans chapter 8, verse 20 through 25, and we're going to talk about that, that literally creation is under a curse. All mankind is under a curse, but even those who have received Jesus as Lord and Savior, they're still part of the curse that's attached to us. It's attached to our body. Our spirit has been born again. The Holy Spirit comes to live in our spirit, and we become the temple of the Holy Spirit. Next of all, our soul is being renewed day by day. And listen, the only two parts of you, if you died today, the only two parts of you that would go to heaven is your spirit and your soul. In, Re in chapter 12 of the book of Hebrews, the Bible says people in heaven are seen there as the spirits of just people made perfect. And that's what happens when you go to heaven. But what you leave behind is your body because the body is made out of the dust of the ground and the dust of the ground received the curse. Everything made of the dust of the ground was cursed. And the curse just ran through the dust of the ground and affected plants and animals. And the part of us that's made out of the dust of the ground received a curse. And from that, then Satan and, and his spiritual death entered into us. The first thing that happened was sin entered in and then through sin, in came death, spiritual death. Man basically died in the garden from the outside in. Jesus Christ has come to give us life from the inside out. And the last part of us is going to receive eternal life will be our body. My spirit has been given eternal life. My soul is eternal. And throughout all of eternity, I'll still be learning. And so that the mind of Christ is something that basically will take an eternity to fully have. And then it goes on to say though, but the last thing that's going to be redeemed, it will be our body. And that will occur when this natural body will put on a spiritual body, when this mortal will put on immortality and this body, which is death doomed, will take on a body that will never die forever. All right. Uh, Romans chapter 8, look at verse 20 down through verse 25. Creation was subjected to futility. This is the curse placed on the earth at the time of Adam. Adam brought this on, not willingly. 
great creation didn't say here, sin to curse. No, not willing, but because of him who subjected it in hope. And when Adam sinned, God allowed a curse to come into this, but he saw the curse would only last for a certain period of time. And that will be until the time when Jesus Christ comes back and sets up his eternal kingdom on this earth. That is the beginning of the millennial reign. Verse 21 goes on to say, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. The first ones that will receive a resurrection body will be the children of God on the earth at the time of the rapture. Then it says in verse 21, the creation then later itself will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the same glorious liberty that the children of God have. On the day when the earth is released from its bondage, and that is this curse that's on the earth, will be of the day of the coming of Jesus Christ, not for the rapture of the church, but seven years later when he comes back to establish his kingdom on this earth. And then those coming from heaven will have glorified bodies. The earth will be released from the bondage of corruption. And the Old Testament tells us that even the trees will clap their hands at the return of the king. The oceans will clap their hands. The earth will break forth into glorious singing. And I like to think of it as an antiphonal. We'll be coming back from heaven singing. He's king of kings and lord of lords. And the earth will be singing it out. And we'll have this antiphonal going on between us who were redeemed and have a resurrection body seven years before that. And during those seven years in heaven, we went through the judgment seat of Christ. We've now received our rewards and now been fashioned into the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. Coming back on that day, nature will break forth also into the same glorious liberty as the children of God. But until that day, nature grows under the pressures of earth. And part of that curse is earthquakes and volcanoes and tornadoes and hurricanes and all the different things we see mounting up and getting closer and closer every single day, but they're not evil. We look at those things as evil. No, it's a birth pang and should bring shouting and rejoicing to us as the birth pangs get closer. That tells us the baby is coming and the baby isn't the return of Jesus Christ. It is his eternal kingdom coming to this earth. And the earth is pregnant with the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. But the good news is, is even though nature goes through these birth pangs. Even Christians go through them. Christians are not divorced from uh, from things on this earth and problems on this earth. We face problems too. But every time we come through a problem, it's like a birth pang. We are that much closer, another day closer to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and us receiving a resurrection body. Look at verse 22. We know that the whole creation groans and labors, this is birth pangs, with birth pangs together until now. From the time of the fall of Adam until now, the earth has been going through birth pangs. Not only that, But we also, that's Christians who have the first fruits of the Spirit. That's the new birth, the Holy Spirit living in us. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly awaiting the adoption, the redemption of our body. This is glorification. This is the one we're still waiting on. For we were saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. Daily, listen, we have been born again by faith, but the hope we're returning to here is the eventual coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, of which John referred to it as the great hope of the church. We are saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Glorification is the final phase of our salvation. Both the earth and the church are waiting for final redemption. And when Jesus Christ comes back to the earth to rule and to reign, what's going to happen is Antichrist will be removed, the false prophet, the beast will be removed, Satan will be removed, all religion will be removed, all unbelievers will be removed, and even the curse on the earth will be removed, and the earth will break forth into glorious rejoicing and shouting, because the entire earth will be like the Garden of Eden back there when Adam and Eve lived in it. Glorification was accomplished before creation. Romans chapter 8, take a look at verse 28 through 30. We know that all things work together for good. Why? Because we have something to look forward to. I mean, every day when things go bad and the government does these things that we're seeing around us and whenever all the diseases we see around us and the the whole uh, governments of the earth working together to take over the earth, we know the tribulation is coming soon, but the good news is we know on the other side of it, Jesus Christ 
is coming back. He's gonna come back to this earth as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's gonna fight the battle of Armageddon and win it and then do all these wonderful things I just told you about at the end of the tribulation to establish his kingdom. We know that that's gonna happen. So every day we have something to look forward to. For the church, we have the rapture of the church to look forward to. And for all of creation, they see the coming of Jesus Christ to remedy this thing and to remove the curse that Adam had placed here. So Romans 8, 28 says, we know that all things work together for good to those that love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined. We've had these things back and we talked about predestination and God's foreknowledge. Whom he foreknew, foreknowledge is the foundation for predestination. He also predestined. He knew who would accept him and he predestined a plan for them. He predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he, Jesus Christ, might be the firstborn among many brethren. I'm the millionth, billionth one born, but Jesus was the first one. Verse 30, moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called, and whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. Notice the last thing is glorification. But I want you to notice something. Called his past tense justified his past tense, but glorified his past tense. I haven't even been glorified, but God sees it as a done deal. Before I was born again, this verse was still here. So God looked through time and saw that Bob would one day as five-year-old Bobby receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, and he made, uh, he made provisions for my birth, new birth, the plans he had for my life, for my calling, for my justification, but he also made plans for my glorification you know what this means? God already sees me as a done deal glorified in heaven. I need to see myself that way. Look through the eyes of the hope of God of what's laid up for me in the future. I will have a glorified body forever and forever. To be honest with you, a billion years from now, I'll have a glorified body. I might as well look at it today. You know what that tells me? If I, if I can see like God does a billion years from now, me standing in heaven around the throne of God, you know what that means? I'm gonna make it through this problem. That's how all things can work together for good. If I see God's plan in my life all the way to the very end of it with a glorified body, then I can tell you something. What's this problem mean? I'm gonna come through it. And the next problem, I'm gonna come through that. And the next problem through that. And the next, that. if God be for me, who can be against me? What can be against me? It simply comes back to this. If I have a glorified body yet to come, then I am, God will prepare me and God will protect me today, tomorrow, the next day, next month, next week, next year. All these things all have been prepared for me. I have a glorious future to look forward to. Glorification, like foreknowledge, predestination, our calling and justification were accomplished before the foundation of the world. And God saw again back there that all this, God already sees me there. I might as well see myself there. And by doing that, then glorification gives hope to everyday problems that you and I have. I've been waiting on this book, Theology Simplified. This is a class I teach at Karis Bible College, and it's my favorite class. I think the student's favorite class is there. And I've been waiting to put this into a book. It's eight different theological terms that sound difficult, but actually are very simple. I just simply think the Bible sometimes is filled with complicated sounding words, but you break it down, it becomes very simple. This book is called Theology Simplified. Let me tell you what all it covers. It covers predestination. It covers reconciliation and sanctification. It covers glorification, justification. Redemption, propitiation, and election are all covered in this book. And again, big words with simple meanings. I bring it down to you. When I used to pastor at the church, I would even tell, I'd say, housewives, you that are listening out there today in the congregation, this is designed for you too. If you can't take this sermon, go home and meditate on it. And then the next morning, prepare a tuna fish sandwich for your children to go to school. Then I missed the point today. The word of God is not difficult. Even the Greek and the Hebrew were written on a third or fourth grade level where people can understand it. So that's what this is for. So, you know, this book will help and bless you tremendously as a person, as a, as a convert, and as a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you teach a Bible class, if you teach a home cell group, or you're a pastor of a church or whatever, this book is for everybody and it's gonna greatly bless you. So I know you're gonna be blessed by getting this book and again, by growing in the things of God. So this book is available, $15. Go to my website bobyandian.com and there you can purchase a copy for yourself. You might be saying, well, $15 sounds like a lot for a book. You'd pay that for a gourmet burger. 
and order a fries and a Coke after it's all over and that meal would last you maybe two or three hours, you'd be hungry again. This will feed you for a lifetime. You can read it over and over again, hand it on to your children. It will continue to feed them. And once you get it, one revelation, you'll say, wow, it was certainly worth the $15. So again, go to my website, bobtheandian.com. You'll find how you can have a copy for yourself. Blessings upon blessings to you. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. All these things we've talked about, what God did for us before the foundation of the world are really more expanded in Ephesians chapter one, verses three through 14. I don't have time to get into these, but Ephesians one, verse three through 14 is the longest sentence in the Bible. It is one literal sentence that goes from verse three all the way through verse 14 of what God did for us before the foundation of the world. And, and in every one of them, it's a past tense. He's already done these things for us. And so what an incredible thing that God is simply showing us where I look forward to God delivering me tomorrow. God says, oh no, 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 it's a done deal. It's already done. I saw it from the foundation of the world that you'll come through any problem that I have in your life. Some of them you may not understand, but you're still gonna understand it when you get to heaven. The point of it is I do not bring you into defeat. I bring you into victory. There's been things in my life that when it was over, I thought this was it. I mean, there's still things that happened in my life I don't even understand. I mean, I came through some terrible things when I was pastor and situations, uh, lawsuits and, and people in our church and, and things they said and did. And it looked like after they left, they succeeded and they did some things, took people with them. And I think God was this. And uh, listen, when I get to heaven, I'm gonna understand everything. I'll see what happened. I'll know what happened at the end because you cannot sow seeds of unrighteousness and get righteousness to come up. You can't keep sowing seeds of righteousness even when unrighteous seeds are being sown around you and you come up in unrighteousness. Know what you sow, you reap. And when I've stood there in simple faith and trust toward God, he's gonna bring me through. Glorification for the church is yet to come, but it's gonna come. And glorification for the church occurs at the rapture of the church. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is the glorification and the time we will receive a resurrection body. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're gonna read verse 35 through 48. So we have a lot of verses to look at. And here someone begins to ask the question as Paul is teaching, because this entire chapter, 1 Corinthians 15 deals with resurrection, starts with the resurrection of Jesus, the proofs of his resurrection, those who saw him, and then starts getting into the resurrection for us, which will be the rapture of the church. And then future resurrections are brought out toward the end of it, two of resurrections after that, of those from the Old Testament and those that are born again during the, the millennial reign of Jesus Christ and, and the, all that stuff is yet to come. But anyway, let's get back to what I was talking about here. What about our resurrection body? And it's like in the middle of his teaching, Paul realizes those people listening to me right now are going, but what will our resurrection body be like this? Will, will, will it be like this? And so he brings it out. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 35 says this, but someone will say, how are the dead raised up? And what kind of body will they have when they, when they do? He says in verse 36, oh, foolish one. Foolish one here doesn't mean you're stupid. It simply means you don't understand. Oh, under, misunderstanding one. What you sow is not made alive unless it dies. And he's talking here about a seed. And what you sow, you do not sow the body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as it pleases him and to each seed his own body. What he's simply saying was here in nature is that everything that you see around you, trees, and, and flowers and all the stuff that grows out of the ground, all of them started with a seed. And basically a seed is small and it produced, the, the house my wife and I used to live at around the house was oak trees. And some of these oak trees were probably a hundred years old or more. And behind our house was the 30 foot cliff that dropped off. At the bottom of that cliff was all these oak trees. And on the top of the cliff was our house. And it was a two story house. We had trees that started at 30 feet down there and came up and were taller than our house. I mean, these trees were massive and they were huge. And you know what an oak tree is? It's almost indestructible. Oak is one of the hardest woods you can find. Here it simply says, 
That all started as an acorn. It started as a seed. It started something small. It started something fragile. And every fall, we would have acorns all around the house. They were covering the sidewalks, everything. I'd walk out to go get in my car in the morning and come to the church to, to uh, work at the office. And I'd step on those things. They'd crunch under my feet. Well, you knew that one was useless already. You couldn't, you couldn't put that in the ground because it was destroyed, all right? But those ones that fell in the ground, you know what would happen? As soon as spring rolled around, we had, we had shoots coming up out of the ground of new oak trees. So we had to go through and cut those things or else we'd have been swamped by them a few years later. So you can see how quickly those things go in the ground and they sprout and all that. Here's the point of what I'm trying to tell you is when you see a seed, you see the shell of the seed. The heart of the seed is on the inside. But when you bury that seed, the outside, the shell dissolves. And when it dissolves, what's on the in the heart comes out. The tree that comes out didn't come from the shell. It came from the heart of the seed, but the shell has to dissolve first. And what's inside? Our resurrection body doesn't come from this body. No, it comes from in here. It's our, our body is sown a natural body, but raised a spiritual body. My body that will come out of the grave or or my body that will be suddenly turned into a resurrection body will not be this physical body and somehow made into another one. No, it's going to come from my spirit. My natural body, like the outside of the seed, is going to dissolve, but what's on the inside will come out. The resurrection body comes from the heart of the seed. It is a spiritual body. It is spirit made tangible. My spirit right now cannot be seen. Oh, I'm sure if you go to heaven, you can see all the spirits have just been made perfect up there. And on the Mount of Transfiguration, uh, Peter, James, and John got to see the two resurrection, or got to see the spirits on the mountain there of Elijah and Moses. So it simply comes back to this again. And that is what, the, what was on that mountain that day will one day be turned into resurrection bodies for Moses and Elijah. In heaven, there's spirits up there. What Their bodies have dissolved in the heart of them are in heaven, but one day they're gonna come back down and then suddenly receive a resurrection body. And the resurrection body is be just like an acorn compared to an oak tree. An acorn is fragile. Your natural body is fragile. You have to walk in faith and protection of God, but a resurrection body is indestructible. I'm simply saying he's simply simply comparing the resurrection body to sowing and reaping. And what you sow, verse 37, you do not sow the body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps of wheat or some other grain, but God gives it a body as it pleases him and to eat seed its own body. Look at verse 39. Now he compares us and other animals and things around us. All flesh is not the same flesh. There's one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of animals, another of fish, another of birds. In other words, what he's saying here is there's no such thing as evolution. All right, fish do not turn into people. Birds don't turn into fish and all these other things. No, no, there's walls placed between them. And there's one type of flesh of people, another flesh of animals, another of fish, another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies. Celestial bodies are those in the sky, those at night when you look up into the air and you see the different ones up there. And here's the point he's gonna start bringing out. In the celestial, you'll see one glory. And you'll see another glory, another glory. No two stars shine the same. No two moons shine the same. No two planets shine the same. And the, the sun and the moon are the two brightest that are out there. But you look out there and no two, by the billions, if you can stand out in a, in a field some night and literally see millions and millions and millions of stars, you couldn't count them all. No two are the same. So will the resurrection bodies be. There are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies. In other words, you can see God's glory in the heavens, the shining up, but you can also see things here on this earth. But the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There's one glory of the sun, Woo, brilliance of the sun. Another glory of the moon, oh, the brilliance of the moon. And another glory of the stars. For one star differs from another in glory, and this includes all the planets. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. I'm gonna stop right there. You know what he's simply saying? Stop to think about this for just a moment. We don't bury Christians, we plant them. They're going to come up. I love this at funerals. Say, we're going to bury them today. I say, no, no, we're going to plant them because they're going to come up. All we're doing is planting the seed and the outside and the shell of the seed is going to dissolve and release the inside, which will go to heaven for a while. But when it comes back, that spirit is going to turn into an incorruptible body, an indestructible body, and it'll be totally different. Notice the body is sown in corruption. It's raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. In other words, there's no glory in this natural body. It's headed toward the grave, but we're going to be raised 
raised up in glory, the magnificent glory of God himself. It is sown in weakness. It's raised in power. You can step on a seed and break it, but the tree that comes up is almost indestructible compared to the shell of the seed that was there. Verse 44, it's sown a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. My natural body right here will be sown one day. In other words, planted in the ground. But when it comes up, it's going to be a body not made out of this natural stuff or the dust of the ground. It's going to be my spirit on the inside becoming tangible. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Right now I'm in a natural body, but one day I'll have a spiritual body just like that of Jesus Christ. He's the only one in heaven right now with a spiritual body seated on the throne of God. Verse 45, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spirit is not first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. The first man was out of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as the heavenly man, so are also those who are heavenly. In other words, I have a body that came from Adam. One day I'll have a body that comes from Jesus Christ, the last Adam. And as we have been born the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's talk about this for just a moment. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. In other words, this verse is saying we will have a resurrection body just like Jesus has. Jesus still looks like Jesus. Bob will still look like Bob. But understand this. What's the difference? Jesus' body could walk through walls. I don't know exactly what it is, but literally all the molecules could pass right through a wall. Jesus just suddenly appeared in the room. Next of all, Jesus could eat and drink and breathe, but it wasn't necessary. He ate with his disciples, but it doesn't take food to keep a resurrection body alive. He could drink with them. He had uh, water and he had fish and all these different things uh, when he was there and he could breathe. In fact, he breathed on his disciples. But listen, eating doesn't keep the resurrection body alive. Drinking doesn't keep it alive and breathing doesn't, but it can be done. Next of all, Jesus could disappear and reappear anywhere else. And so he was here and then suddenly he was over here and he said he disappeared and then he was over here later on. And that again is what a resurrection body can do. We'll have a body just like Jesus Christ. He could travel and even exist in outer space. He's left the earth on, uh, standing on the Mount of Olives. He went up through the atmosphere, went right into outer space and then went right to the third heaven and sat down at the right hand of the Father in a resurrection body. So we can one day. We can travel the entire uh, universe. We can go to any part of the universe and you know how fast we go? At the speed of thought. I can think it and be there. That's how fast. And you and I can join hands and go to the Pleiades, go to the very ends of the universe and see it. This is what's going to happen to us one day when we have a resurrection body. This is called glorification. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.